which turns 31 years old this year. And this program is brought to you by a wonderful uh, team of partners, and I'm proud of all of us. Harry S. Truman National Historic Site, the Truman Home and the Truman Farm Home in Independence in Grandview, Missouri. We are part of the National Park Service, the United States Department of the Interior. And this is in partnership with the Harry S. Truman Presidential Library and Museum and our friends at Mid-Continent Public Library. And I would just like to point out that the portrait of Mr. McCullough that I have on the title screen there is one of my favorites of Mr. McCullough. He is holding in his hand a summer hat that a National Park Service ranger would wear. We in the National Park Service, we very much mourned the loss of Mr. McCullough last year. He was a very good friend of the National Park Service. My relationship with him even went back even before my career with this agency. Indeed, it was some of his writing, particularly a biography of Theodore Roosevelt that made me decide that I would really like to study history. I would like to get my hands dirty with these primary sources that, that he used to tell stories and then also turn around and share this with adults and, and children. So he really inspired me in that career. I was born in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And if you have not heard of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, it's in West Central Pennsylvania, and it's about 80 to 85 miles due east of Pittsburgh. Johnstown, Pennsylvania probably is most famous for a series of terrible floods, the worst of which was on May 31st, 1889, a flood that killed over 2,000 209 men, women, and children. It was the worst disaster of its kind in its day. It started the first major civilian relief effort in American history, and it is perhaps the quintessential Victorian melodrama. And it was also the subject of David McCullough's first book. So as I transitioned into the National Park Service, my very first national park that I worked at was Johnstown Flood National Memorial, where I worked for about 17 years. And over those years, we had many relations with Mr. McCullough, and every one of them was absolutely special. So he has had a very special part of my life and then also in my career. So our goals with this program is to walk through Harry Truman's life together via this book. And what I would like to do during this program series is to share with you some of the sources that Mr. McCullough used while putting this book together, some documents and some three-dimensional objects from the collection of the National Park Service and the Truman Library, uh, the Library of Congress and other places. And all of these sources come together much like parts of an algebraic equation. And they come together to tell the complete story of Harry Truman. Now, this book was published in 1992. And what you were looking at in this slide right now is the copy that I bought in 1992. And as you can see, the over the years, the many, many, many sticky notes that are there, uh, looking at it, it's to the point where Maybe the sticky notes don't have much purpose anymore. But I will tell you that the other day in our visitor center museum store, we received a shipment of Mr. McCullough's book, Truman, in paperback, and it was the 60th edition. And that is absolutely amazing. And what that means is not only did this book do well for Mr. McCullough and Simon and & Schuster, it, it just means that people around the world via this book have dived into Harry Truman's life. And this book played and continues to play a significant role in the evolution of how historians and 
the population alike view Harry Truman in retrospect. So the Truman book is a very important part of the recent Truman historiography. And again, we couldn't ask for better partners with Mid-Continent Public Library. They have my appreciation. And if any of my friends from the Truman Library and the National Archives are watching and listening, I want to tell you personally what you folks mean to me. You are some of my best friends in the world, and you are my heroes. If you have not been to the Truman Library recently, please do so. They just finished a wonderful new res uh, renovation of the museum side. And Truman envisioned that facility to be a place where his papers could be housed and citizens could come and learn about their government, meaning your government. This belongs to you. So please visit the Truman Library and I'll just leave this at this. If Harry Truman could see what the staff of the Truman Library is doing with his institution right now, he would be beaming with pride. This is a 10 month series. And so we will walk through Truman's life via this book and conclude in December. And so by the end of the year, all of you will have our version of a PhD in Trumanology, okay? And I hope we can have some fun and discussion. A lot of serious things to talk about, but I hope that we can have some fun. And when I have appreciation there, that appreciation is intended not only for my partners, but for you. You have dedicated your time to being here today. And I know that one of the worst things that people don't look forward to every year is filling out their tax forms. But I want to be one of those civil servants who looks you in the eye via a laptop camera. I wanna say thank you for doing that because the American people, you make everything that we do here at the Truman Home, the Farm Home, the Truman Library, Mid-Continent Public Library, you make everything that we do possible. Thank you. Now, this program series is dedicated to the memory of President Truman, his life partner, his beautiful wife, Bess Wallace Truman, to their family, all dedicated with love, and it is dedicated to our friend, Mr. McCullough. And we'll talk about it. So we're gonna talk about the man from Missouri. Mr. Truman loved talking about Missouri. Almost any time you physically see or hear Mr. Truman talking about Missouri, he will get the biggest grin and smile on his face and his eyes will crinkle a little bit. No matter what he did in life, no matter where he was or who he was with, he was proud to be from Missouri and Jackson County, Missouri, and of course, proud to be an American. But I wanted to begin by showing you the cover of Truman without the title and Mr. McCullough's name. The original painting is done by a gentleman named Wendell Miner, who does a lot of wonderful book cover art. And it is a striking cover that Simon & Schuster chose for this book. And it does really represent a timeline of, of Harry Truman. That, that beautiful skyline, there, there is just nothing like a beautiful blue Missouri sky. In the bottom left, you will see the farm home and the farm, and we will explore how important Mr. Truman's family's farm was to him personally and to his development as a person and as a leader. You will see an outline of independence from where I am speaking right now. I'm speaking to you from a bedroom in Bess Wallace Truman's brother's house. His name was George Wallace. So I'm speaking to you from the George Wallace home. Harry Truman called independence the center of the world. He wasn't born here in independence. He moved here when he was about six years old, but he loved independence and he felt that it represented together with Missouri and Jackson County, Missouri, that it represented the best of America. And the White House on the right side with the 
American flag raise that the president is in residence. But what really is, I think, the most capturing part of this illustration is simply the land. About three years ago, I was asked to go and speak to a group about an hour and a half, about an hour and 45 minutes east of Independence. I arrived uh, about 45 minutes early for the program and they weren't ready yet. I just simply sat on a bench and looked and watched. I am not from Missouri. I'm from West Central Pennsylvania. But as I sat on that bench, looking at the land all around me, that is the land that meant so much to Truman and his fellow Missourians here. Knowing that land, knowing the people who lived on this land, knowing the people who worked on this land, that's what helped make Harry Truman, Harry Truman. So it was very wise to show farmland and all of this, the farm home, independence, the ground, the land, that is the road to the White House that you see on the cover. So we're gonna talk a little bit about family. We are all in so many ways, representatives of, of who our ancestors are. And so I wanted to, talk a little bit about some of the president's ancestors. And we'll start with his paternal side. And so you'll see a photograph of his grandfather, Solomon Young. Harry Truman, thankfully, had memories of his grandfather, Solomon Young. Solomon Young was one of the more prosperous farmers and businessmen here in Jackson County and in Western Missouri. He is remembered today not only for being one of the grandfathers of Harry Truman, but he is also remembered as one of the pioneers of the Western roads and the Western trails. Independence, Missouri is also known as the queen city of the trails. So many of what we now call these historic Western trails, they started here or near here and passed through here. Now, of course, we call them the historic trails today, but when they're living back then, as Mr. McCullough was fond of saying, it wasn't history to them, it was now. So Solomon Young, over the years, used these Western trails to go to places like Salt Lake City. And one time it was remembered that Harry Truman remembered that while president of the United States, Sometimes he would take a trip leaving from Kansas City and he would fly over Salt Lake City and he would realize that that would take him really just a few hours in the presidential aircraft. And he would remember his grandfather and he would remember that his grandfather's wagon loads going to Salt Lake City would take months and months and months. And via these trips on these Western trails, Solomon Young was able to build a business and a reputation. And here in Jackson County, Missouri, Solomon Young and his wife, Harriet Louisa Gregg Young, had one of the largest farms at one point. It was well over 600 acres here in Jackson County, Missouri. If we had the benefit of a time machine, if Congress past funds for a time machine, I would love to go back and meet all of these people. One in particular that I would like to meet is Harry Truman's maternal grandmother, Harriet Young, an absolutely amazing lady. And you'll see a photograph there of her later in life. And again, Harry Truman had very good memories of his grandmother, Young. She lived longer than her husband. Solomon Young died in 1892. Mrs. Young continued until 1909 after the Trumans moved back to their farm to work on it in, in Grandview, Missouri. While Solomon Young was out on his westward trips, it was Harriet Young 
who would maintain the home and the farm here in Jackson County. And that was very difficult, particularly during the Civil War and during the age of General Orders Number 11, when for a period of time, the family was forced to abandon their farm in Grandview and they had to move northward a little bit to Platte County, Missouri. But Harriet Young had this sense of independence and inner strength that these pioneer folks had. She endured, her family endured. Now, on the right side of the screen, you'll see a photograph of three persons. Grandmother Young is seated in the middle. To her right is a photograph of Harry Truman's sister, Mary Jane Truman, a beautiful young lady. And then standing there is the gentleman that the 33rd president of the United States was named for, Harrison Young, Harry Truman's uncle Harrison. Now, I'm very sorry to say that that is believed to be the only photograph of Harrison Young, but he is another individual whom I would like to meet in a time machine. One of the blessings that we have in the world of Truman are what are known as the Dear Bess and Dear Harry letters. And it is always so wonderful when Harry Truman is writing to his love, Bess Wallace, about life on the farm. And we'll be exploring those letters throughout this program series. It's always wonderful when he makes a reference to his Uncle Harrison or his Uncle Harry. It was a marvelous relationship. Uncle Harrison also had farm in him, but he also relied on his sister, who would be Harry Truman's mother, to help operate the farm. But another time machine moment would be to go back and witness some interactions between Harry Truman and the gentleman whom he was named for, Uncle Harrison. Now, on the paternal side, we need a unfortunately, none of the Truman siblings had any memory of their grandmother Truman, Mary Jane Holmes Truman. She died just a few years before the future president was born, but she was a, a beautiful lady. I think she died way too young. But as you look at the photograph of Anderson Ship Truman there in the middle, I'd like for you to take a few moments and think about some interactions that you may have had with your grandparents growing up or as you got older. Now, grandfather Truman died when Harry Truman was just a toddler and Truman was present when grandfather Truman died. Grandfather Truman died in the Solomon Young farm home. But as was remembered by Harry Truman's cousin, Ethel Nolan and others, Harry Truman was such a child, even as a toddler, that grandfather Truman, at one point, looked at the young boy, Harry, and said, someday, that boy will be president of the United States. And you'll see on the right side of the screen, they were both from Kentucky, as were the Youngs, and they both migrated here to Western Missouri. Primary documents are just so absolutely wonderful. And so you'll see the application for the marriage of Anderson Ship Truman, Mary Jane Holmes Truman. And we do documents every day in our lives, sometimes not realizing that we do it, whether it's an electric bill or, or whether it's a church document or a banking document. We just may never know what future historians may want to look at of something of ours. But when I look at something like this certificate, and I think about what grandfather Truman said uh, about little boy Harry, did they ever have any idea that someday they would have a grandson who would be the most powerful person 
in the world. Now, one thing that Harry Truman alluded to in some interviews and has been uncovered in Truman historiography is that grandfather Truman was known to have enslaved persons on the property in Grandview. This is one document that I wanted to share with you. And this is a, what was called a slave schedule. And this lists the three African-Americans that Anderson Ship Truman owned in 1850. I wish that we knew a little bit more about that. And much like other documents like this, we are still trying to assess how to interpret and understand that. Part of the problem is that there just isn't much in the way of additional primary documents to give more context, but we do have this document. What can we do with this document? We acknowledge it and we say that Anderson Ship Truman had one woman, an African American woman who was 30 years old, a young woman, six years old, and one who was three. And you'll notice that there are no names and we will never know who those three persons were or what their ultimate fates were, either going into 1860 into the war or post the Emancipation Proclamation and the end of the Civil War. But we accept the primary documents, we acknowledge them and we share them and we're honest about it. I think that's what Truman would expect. And presidential parents. John Anderson Truman, December 1881. Martha Ellen, Maddie, they often called her Maddie Truman, December of 1881. They were married shortly after Christmas in 1881. I want to share with you something exciting that I found yesterday. Harry Truman once said that sometimes the only thing that may be new to you is the history that you don't know. Shortly after Harry Truman died, a book was published called Plain Speaking, written by a fellow by the name of Merle Miller. Some of you may have read or some of you may have the book. Very popular book, very controversial book because of the lack of some of the sourcing in the book. Well, yesterday I was researching at the Truman Library and I was researching the Merle Miller papers, which again are open and available for you to inspect as well. They belong to you now. And in the files was a very interesting document that caught my attention. The photograph that you see there of John Anderson Truman from 1881 that is the last known photograph of Harry Truman's father. He died in 1914. So there's a long gap of time where we don't have images of what he looked like. And so I often wondered, well, what did the president's father look like as he aged? What did he look like when his sons were born, when Mary Jane was born, when they moved to Independence, when they moved to Kansas City and and so forth down to the farm. Why are there no other photographs of John Truman? We don't know. But in the Merle Miller papers, there's a very interesting statement. And it seems to be attributed to Harry Truman himself that said that the official portrait of President Harry S. Truman taken at Potsdam in the summer of 1945 looks remarkably like his father. So I encourage everybody at some point between now and the next time that we meet to simply get onto the World Wide Web and look for Potsdam photographs of President Truman 
And you may be looking at an image of what John Anderson Truman looked like later in life. But we're going to be talking a lot about these folks as we get into chapter three in particular. And again, some primary sources that we just love, the application to Mary here in Jackson County, Missouri. This is another document that I love here. Harry Truman was born in Lamar, Missouri, May 8th, 1884. They didn't live in Lamar very long. So of course, Harry Truman had no memories of Lamar, Missouri, but seemingly shortly before the family moved from Lamar, starting to move a little bit northward in Missouri, Mama Truman, as she was called, was given this wonderful letter of commendation uh, from her Baptist minister in Lamar. In essence, that wherever the Truman family landed, she would be able to present this letter and be admitted as a member of the Baptist church. I love this letter. It, there's just nothing like holding something like this in your hand. Another reason that I like this is as the world started to get to know Mama Truman in particular, as her son became more famous, especially after he became United States Senator for the state of Missouri, Mama Truman made for a, a wonderful news story. America really, really became crazy about Mama, Mrs. Truman. And she described herself and her son described her too as a quote, light foot Baptist. And what did that mean? That meant that contrary to how some would view the faith, she enjoyed a little bit of dancing once in a while and she enjoyed some playing of some cards and such. But Harry Truman's mother played an absolutely critical role and who the future president of the United States became. And no matter who the president was talking to, whether it be Winston Churchill or Joseph Stalin, any member of his cabinet, the most important voice that Harry Truman had going into his ear was his mother. And whether it was in person, whether she was on the phone with him, all she had to say to him was, be good, Harry. Those three words were a guiding principle for President Truman. I'd like to share with you a little trait right now. Harry Truman's youngest sister, Mary Jane Truman, is one of my favorite people in the world. She died in 1978. Gosh, how I wish I would have the opportunity to meet her. We don't have very many examples of Mary Jane Truman's voice caught on camera or on tape. But I would like to share this photograph, this little video with you that was taken in the early 1960s. And I hope this works. It doesn't look like the sound quality is working for us, Doug. Okay. And Beth, did you say that that didn't play well? We didn't hear anything, apologies. Okay, let's try this. I know sometimes with, I'm using Microsoft PowerPoint. I'll try this again, let's move on and I will try this again a little bit later. Now, I wanted to share with you one of our favorite artifacts from the Truman Collection. Harry S. Truman National Historic Site was created 40 years ago this year by an act of Congress. In addition to preserving the Truman home and the Truman Farm home and the Wallace homes here in the Nolan home, 
thanks to the Truman family and the Wallace family and others, we also take care of, for you, the American people, over 84,000 objects, papers, 3D objects, and everyone tells a story. Every single object tells a story. And there's nothing like seeing it. Well, what you are looking at there is a double barrel shotgun with walnut stock that belonged to Mama Truman. Mama Truman was a very educated lady. She was a very talented musician. Now, unfortunately, we don't have her voice recorded on tape to the best of my knowledge. She's often not given enough credit, but like Harry Truman's other grandmother, Harriet Young, Mama Truman had a spine of steel. And a large part of that became, came from the family and from the experiences in the Civil War. And so, yes, don't mess with Mama Truman because she had that shotgun in her possession and she knew how to use it. But that is just one of many objects that we preserve and take care of for you on behalf of the American people. And so we thank you for the honor of being able to do so. So the birth of the president, May 8th, 1884. And contrary to popular opinion, when Mama Truman gave birth to her son, Harry, there was no fanfare of hail to the chief. But when Harry Truman was born in Lamar, Missouri on May 8th of 1884, his father, John Anderson Truman, put a horseshoe up on their home in Lamar. John Anderson Truman in Lamar was a livestock trader, a very well-respected livestock trader, and a man who was determined on living the American dream. Now, Harry Truman would have had an older brother, but he didn't survive. This Baby Truman was born on October 28th of 1882, and Baby Truman is buried in Lamar, Missouri. Now, in Lamar, Missouri is an absolutely wonderfully charming state park dedicated to Harry Truman, Harry S. Truman Birthplace State Park. I very much encourage everybody to visit that site. Again, Truman had no memory of it, but the site played an important part in some of Truman's later campaign efforts. And again, another primary document, wanted to show you the birth registry for Harry S. Truman. What's interesting is that some parts of the documents were not completed until many, many years later. Very interesting. So here we have the American family. We have the mother and the father of the future president of the United States. You have there a photograph of Harry Truman as a baby, probably age about one. There in the third photograph, you have a photograph of Harry Truman's brother, John Vivian, and Harry Truman on the right. Notice the walking stick that the future president is holding in his left hand. And then on the right side, you will see a photograph of Harry Truman's young sister, Mary Jane, who was born on the family farm in Grandview. And over the almost 40 years that I have studied Harry Truman and his family, even outside of his notoriety as president of the United States, they would be worth studying as a great typical American family trying to live that American dream that we are all trying to do. Now, Harry Truman had memories of his grandfather's farm. Now, when you come to the Truman Farm in Grandview, Missouri today, you will see a farm home, but that is not the original farm home. The original young farm home in Grandview burned shortly after Grandfather Solomon Young died. 
there are no known photographs of the original farm home. And almost everything, it seems, that was inside of that farm home was destroyed. Now, later in life, after he was president of the United States, Harry Truman had a vision of actually building his presidential library and museum in Grandview, Missouri. And his vision was to build his library there and rebuild his grandfather's original farm home from memory. And so one thing I did for you today was I pulled together what you were looking at are drawings done by Harry S. Truman from memory of what his grandfather's original farm home looked like. So these are the only known images of what the original Solomon Young farm home would have looked like. We wonder, we wonder. Now the farm home that is in Grandview, Missouri today, which will open for tours, by the way, in early May, that was built probably piece by piece probably in the last five to six years of the 1890s. And so it too is historic in that the Youngs and the Trumans lived in that farm home, but how we wish we had more memories or images of the original Solomon and Harriet Young farm home in Grandview. At the age of six, John A. Truman and Maddie Truman decided to move from Grandview, Missouri to Independence, Missouri. And the reason the story goes was that Mama Truman and her husband wanted their children to have the advantage of being in the best schools possible. And they were in independence. I love this line. And if you're from Kansas City, I apologize. But Harry Truman, for the rest of his life, always said that Kansas City was a suburb of independence. He called independence the center of the world for the rest of his life. And it, he would call it his home for a good part of his life. So he moved here when he was six, about the time that he got eyeglasses. But his life really changed one day when he started attending a Presbyterian Sunday school. And you may think that's odd. If Mama Truman and her husband, if the family, if they were Baptists, why were they attending a Presbyterian Sunday school? Well, part was because Mama Truman was offered a very warm invitation from the minister of, of, of the Presbyterian Church here on Maple in Independence. And then also there are some, some societal structure issues here in Independence, but mostly because Mama Truman received that warm invitation. So one day, while at that Sunday school in Independence, six-year-old Harry Truman happened to see a little five-year-old girl with the most beautiful blue eyes and beautiful curly blonde hair that he had ever seen. Some other presidential sites may disagree with me, but I think we are going to start today sharing the story of the greatest presidential love story in history. The future president of the United States fell in love with his future first lady at the age of six. She was five. And it all started at First Presbyterian Church here in Independence. And who was this beautiful young lady? Her name was Elizabeth Virginia Wallace. She was the daughter of David Willock and Madge Gates Wallace. Elizabeth Virginia Wallace's grandfather was George Porterfield Gates, who had a big, beautiful home at 219 North Delaware Street in Independence. His wife, Elizabeth Emery Gates. George Gates was a native of Vermont. Elizabeth Gates was a native of Great Britain. They eventually got together somehow, came here to Independence. George Gates became a partner in a flour mill not too far from where I am sitting here in Independence, a flour mill that created some of the most popular such products in the Midwest 
including something called the queen of the pantry flower. And I would propose to you that if in that time machine, you were able to jump back into a lot of kitchens at the time, you would find that a lot of people were baking and cooking and such using the queen of the pantry flour. It was called the best in the Midwest. So that product created what we would call today new money. And Mr. Gates, his status was reflected by the home here at 219 North Delaware Street. Well, Bessie Wallace, as she was known at the time, was of that lineage. So Bessie Wallace was born in February of 1885, so just a little younger than Harry Truman. And I picked some photographs of her youth. She was a beautiful baby. And you'll see her again at 1887, probably about two years old. And there she is in 1889 at about four years old. But I wanted to show you a photograph of her that is listed at being around 1890. And the reason I wanted to do that was I wanted to show you how Bessie Wallace would have likely looked when Harry Truman came upon her at that Sunday school. He fell in love. Was it reciprocated? Not necessarily. But maybe some of the, the gentlemen in our audience today can sympathize with having a longing love for a lady who perhaps doesn't return that love, at least for a while. But for Harry Truman, I really do believe that every time that he looked at Bess Wallace Truman, he saw that beautiful five-year-old girl with the golden curly hair and the blue eyes. That memory stayed with him for the rest of his life. So once in school, Harry Truman, uh, once in independence, Harry Truman goes to school. Second grade photograph. And I'll give you a few seconds, and I know that title's in the way. I hope it doesn't hurt. But can you point out the future president of the United States? Right here in the corner, left corner. Now, what's, what's interesting is that it appears as if president, the future president is holding something in a pouch or, or in a pocket or something like that. It may be his eyeglasses. When Truman was about six years old, he remembered, which would coincide at about the time that his family moved to independence. Truman and his family attended a fireworks show. And it struck people as odd that Truman wasn't remarking on the bright colors. You know, when we go to fireworks and we ooh and ah over the bright colors and the patterns and everything, they noticed that young Master Harry wasn't doing that. Took him to an eye doctor and Harry Truman was diagnosed with a condition that's simply known as flat eyeballs. Uh, I could share with you the, the prescription that he had later in life. I don't know how to read it, but it was a condition that he would have the rest of his life. And so starting at the age of six and for the last 82 years of his life, he wore really thick eyeglasses. Now, in a way, he said that that had a little bit of an adverse effect upon him because, because of the expense of the glasses, he wasn't able to play baseball and a lot of the athletic things that his friends were doing, including Bessie Wallace. But once he had those glasses, another world opened up to him in that he was able to better read the printed word. So Mama Truman and John A. Truman did their son, their children, all of them, a favor by introducing the written word, whether it was in a family Bible or whether it was in a newspaper or books, turned them into appreciators of the written word. And in a way, you'll see this reflected in Harry Truman's second grade report card. How many of you still have your report cards from then? Uh, for a long time, I was sort of worried that my grade school report cards were, were lost. I was thrilled a few months ago to find most of them sort of embarrassed when I saw some of the grades in retrospect, but I was happy to find the report card. And you'll see, 
the future president's report card here. Pretty good marks, pretty good marks for spelling and for reading and writing. Language, look at that, 100, 199. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that there are some days absent. You might remember from McCullough's book how Harry Truman did have some health challenges in his childhood diphtheria. I'm reading a new biography of Eleanor Roosevelt and Diphtheria is an enemy of Eleanor Roosevelt's family. Uh, it killed her mother and her brother. And that was very much a threat. And Harry Truman, while struggling with diphtheria as a child, was so paralyzed that for a while he had to be pushed in a baby carriage and treated with whiskey and other horrible, horrible tasting things. Thankfully, he was able to recover. Well, one of the reasons that we love this document is that it is signed by his mother, and it's one of the very few things that we do have that is in Mama Truman's hand. And I don't suspect that Harry Truman was afraid to hand that report card to his mother to sign like I was afraid to hand some of mine to my mother over the years. But uh, in addition to the love and the support that John A. and Maddie Truman gave to Harry Truman and to John Vivian and to Mary Jane, that sense of security and that sense that the American dream is, is alive, Two precious gifts that John and Maddie Truman gave to their son, Harry, were represented by a couple of these things. One of them was this set of books, a series that is often described as having an unfortunate title, but that's the way that it was, a very Victorian set from the 1890s called Great Men and Famous Women. Of course, these are in the public domain today, so you can go find these and, and read these. And there are entries on everybody from famous businessmen to statesmen to politicians, military leaders, naval leaders, even actors of the stage and notable performers. Now, this, these were serialized, and then eventually the Trumans had them bound into a set, and Truman remembered that he was given this set when he was about 12 years old, and this, the very set of great men and famous women that was given to Harry Truman as a boy, they are still sitting on the shelf of his office at the Truman Library to this very day. This set of books were very, very important to him. They taught him how to open his eyes to history, not only just to read it, but to understand it and understand context and understand people. And the other is a document that I'm not sure Mr. McCullough had access to because this document is from the Mary Jane Truman Papers, excuse me, at the Truman Library. And it is a payment receipt for the family piano that the Trumans had at their Waldo Street house, which isn't too far from here. And so Mr. and Mrs. Truman very much encouraged Harry Truman to play this piano. And for the rest of his life, Harry Truman was a very good piano player. He often self-deprecated that talent. And he said, well, he could have either been a politician or a piano player in a body house, but he loved the piano. He was trained in classical piano, even was given a special lesson by one of his inspirations, Padraski himself. And these documents like this, the piano payment receipt, they're good examples of how like in our lives, our parents invest in us and perhaps those investments in us will pay off dividends in the future. And so thankfully documents like these survive. So off and on, Harry and Best Wallace Truman, uh, Harry and Best Wallace Truman attended school together. 
And if anything positive came out of Harry Truman having diphtheria, it was that eventually he and Bess Wallace ended up being in the same grade together. So sometimes he carried her books. There are marvelous stories that have been passed down of them studying together, Latin and the classics. Bessie Wallace had a wonderful whistle. I don't, I can't whistle, but she would step out onto the porch of her home and make a special whistle. And all of her friends would come running. Miss Wallace was one of the darlings of the neighborhood here. She was the best at any sport that you threw at her. She too excelled in academics. And Harry Truman was just head over heels in love with this young lady. But there's no indication that it was reciprocated at this time. That's what makes this, in, this next photograph very interesting. Now, you might remember from Mr. McCullough's book that from their classical education, when Truman engaged with his friends and his cousins, Ethel and Nellie Noland, who lived here on Delaware Street at 216, he often referred to himself as Horatio. It's wonderful. He signed his name that way in some cases, and that's how he referred to himself quite, quite often. So in May of 1901, you are looking at the graduating class of Independence High School. I love to share this photograph on our social media pages every May. And you might remember your class pictures and you might be like me. I remember graduating from high school really scared of what the future held. I knew what I wanted to study in school, but what would I be able to do with that? What was my life going to be like at 25 or 30, 35, 40? I, I, I was rather fearful of that. Well, let's look at the faces of those at Independence High School in May of 1901. I'm not so sure I see that apprehension that I had. I see a lot of very confident faces, a lot of very intelligent faces, and a lot of faces I wish I knew their stories. I, I wonder where they went and where their lives took them. But the reason I love to share this photograph with modern graduating classes is that we don't know where life is going to take us, even those of us who are older. So when this class posed for this photograph in 1901, did they have any idea that in this photograph would be a future president of the United States, his future first lady, second row on the right with a, a wonderful grin on her face, a very confident grin, and then in the bottom left row, a man who would be that president of the United States press secretary, a fellow by the name of Charlie Ross. So in one class photograph, you have a president of the United States, his first lady, and his press secretary. It really hasn't happened since, and I often wonder, will it ever happen again? And with this photograph, too, I like to pay attention to the motto that was on the window of Independence High School, Juventus Space Mundi. I use that in my email signature. I use it all the time. That means youth, the hope of the world. And I would like to conclude today's talk by just saying youth, the hope of the world, that is still very true in 2023. One of the honors of my job is the ability to work with youth in the area. Our youth inspire me. And I can't wait to see where today's youth takes us in the future. All right. Well, thank you all so much for attending and we will see you next time, same time, same place. And we look forward to chatting more about Truman then. Thank you so much, Doug.
Thank you, Beth, and thank you all. Thank you for allowing us to do what we do. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you for everything. Thank you.